Uh, so there's a phrase that we use occasionally, low man on the totem pole, you know that, you know that phrase, uh, originally came from settlers to America who actually had misunderstood the meaning of uh, totem poles, uh, which historically had been created by the American Indians of the Pacific Northwest. Totem poles were uh, created by those people groups for a variety of purposes. Um, might have been remembering ancestors or perhaps uh, telling of a, some sort of legendary story. Uh, I read that uh, these poles might be signs of welcome. They might even have been constructed to ridicule a certain person. Uh, Native Americans have communicated that the poles didn't actually have a hierarchy to them. So whether you're in the top spot there or the, the bottom spot there didn't necessarily have a, a special meaning uh, to it. However, this misunderstanding uh, that the settlers had of totem poles kind of uh, cemented itself in American language, right? And so today we use the phrase, low man on the totem pole, to describe someone who is low on the list of importance in a business or in some sort of organization of people. Uh, you know this, the, the, the executives of a company, uh, I guess, would be the people we would call high on the totem pole in that company. Maybe um, the folks that are doing maintenance or security or, you know, mailroom, we might say that they are low on the totem pole in that particular uh, organization. There's an idea that's implanted into our, um, into those of us who grew up in American culture, uh, an idea called the American dream, uh, which carries this uh, image of a, a person who starts out with nothing, but thanks to the freedoms and, and the opportunities in, in our country, uh, that person rises out of the ashes and becomes someone very successful and important. And so we might say that that person started low on the totem pole, but then rose to be at or, or very near the, the top. I'm going to argue today that although the, the values of hard work and freedom that are a part of that American dream vision, uh, although those are really good things, um, when it comes to the aspect of the American dream of having this drive to be top dog, a drive to be at the top of the totem pole, uh, the Bible teaches us some, some differing values. Last time I, I brought a sermon to you two weeks ago, uh, I spoke on how Christ followers ought to adopt and maintain a positive attitude in life. We're to be the ones who uh, look for the good in life rather than the bad. We're to look for the good in people rather than the bad. We're to be encouragers rather than criticizers. Today I'm going to bring to you one more sermon on attitudes that Christians ought to have. And out of many uh, attitudes that we could talk about, I've picked two for us to, to talk about and focus on today. Both of the attitudes we're going to talk about this morning uh, provide support for a, a, a general statement or idea that I want to uh, say to you now at the outset here. Here is that statement. I believe that Christ followers are called to seek to be low on the totem pole rather than high. I believe uh, that Christ followers are called to seek to be low on the totem pole rather than high. That statement is going to need some explanation. Uh, don't jump to any conclusions yet before hearing me. Um, and, and really, I think the statement is going to push a little bit against some of our Americanness. <laughs> kind of sounds like I'm saying something that goes against uh, part of the idea of the American dream there. But I'll say it again. I believe Christ followers are called to seek to be low on the totem pole. And in fact, I'll add a, 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 a something to that statement now to make it a little more clear and, and even more challenging. I think Christ followers are called to seek to be low on the totem pole and to be contentedly low on the totem pole. We're to aim low and be content with it. I will explain this as we go along. Well, let's start out now thinking about the first of the two attitudes we're going to talk about uh, today, which I believe... Christ followers are called to display in our lives. And if you've been around this church for a while, which most of you have, uh, this first one is not going to surprise you much. It is this. Christ followers are called to live our lives with an attitude of humble servanthood. We're called to live our lives with an attitude of humble servanthood. 
The Bible teaches this attitude, and, and it's actually one of the surprising ones in, in the Bible. Um, no one would be surprised if Christianity taught that we're to have an attitude of humble servant toward, towards God, right? I mean, uh, every religion out there would tell you to humble yourself and, and serve God or the gods. You know, they might have put it that way. Um, and, and Christianity does follow suit on that. We are to humble ourselves before the one true God and, and, and serve serve him. But the surprising thing in Christianity is that it, it teaches us also to have this attitude towards other people, not just God, and not just some other people, all other people. So that's an idea that sets Christianity apart. Christ followers are called to live our lives with an attitude of humble servanthood towards God and other people. Here's what the Bible has to say about that. Matthew 20. The mother of Zebedee's sons, who would be the disciples John and James, came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. So, See what she's wanting there? She, uh, this mother is wanting her sons to be at the top of the totem pole in God's kingdom. We continue reading. Jesus said to them, To sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the other uh, ten disciples heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers Jesus called them all together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, so if there were a, a, a household, uh, if, there, if there was a totem pole that ranked the importance of those who belonged to an Israelite household back when Jesus was talking there, uh, no doubt the servant of that household, if there was one, would be at the very bottom, right? John and James' mother wanted greatness for her sons in the kingdom of God, but Jesus explained that greatness in the kingdom of God works in the opposite way uh, of what happens on this earth. Greatness in the kingdom is exhibited through having the genuine attitude of a humble servant. Jesus calls us to seek to be low on the totem pole. Let's look at another passage now, Uh, another one that bucks up against at least part of this American dream. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, uh, those verses say to us, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Is selfish ambition uh, part of the American system? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility... Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So, okay, does this passage mean that we're not to be working to make sure that our needs are met or the needs of our family? Of course not, right? You, you know, uh, if you've been a regular Bible reader, you know by now that many biblical teachings are overstated for effect. And and I think that's what's uh, happening here. There are a lot of others out there. And if we were going to put all of their needs, uh, all of their needs, literally above our own needs, uh, we would die, right? It would be impossible for us to do that. But just because this teaching is overstated doesn't mean we can ignore Paul's point here. And his point is that we are to put uh, as a very high priority in our lives meeting the needs of the others around us. Fits within Jesus' call to be servants. We're to be humble, we're to serve. And of course, Jesus is our model in this. 
as he is in all things. Uh, if we would continue reading there in Philippians 2, uh, we would find these words next. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, Jesus made himself nothing, low man on the totem pole. By taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus modeled an attitude of humble servanthood for us. He was the ultimate servant. And he taught that we are to have an attitude of humble servanthood, and you probably remember the story of uh, Jesus taking on the task of a lowly servant and washing the dust off of his disciples' feet. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud, shows favor to the humble. So this is attitude number one of the two we're going to look at today, that Christ followers ought to seek to adopt and maintain in our lives, we're called to live with an attitude of humble servanthood. Next attitude I want us to talk about, so number two out of two uh, for the day, I, I think you're going to find interesting. It, it's one that uh, I've been doing a little processing on in my own Bible study uh, lately, something that I am beginning to think is actually a bigger deal biblically than maybe I thought before. And it is this. I believe that Christ followers are called to live our lives with an attitude of submissive obedience. We're called to live our lives with an attitude of submissive obedience. Once again here, no one uh, would... Um, be surprised if Christianity uh, called us to have submissive obedience to God. Uh, Christianity does, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but Christianity goes further than that, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Uh, first off, though, Christianity does say that we're supposed to have an attitude of submissive obedience uh, to our Creator God. That message is given pretty loud and clear in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, especially Old Testament. Um, the New Testament says that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, part of that Romans road Paul talked about last Sunday. Okay. Penalty for disobeying God is death. We need to submit ourselves for our creator and learn to follow his good life-giving laws for us. When Jesus was asked uh, which is the most important commandment from God, he answered that question by saying this from Mark 12. 29. The most important commandment, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. What does it look like to love the Lord your God? Well, Jesus said in, in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And a few verses before that, in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commands. So, number one commandment, according to Jesus, is to love God. And how do we show love to God? It starts with seeking to obey him. James 1.22 says we're to be doers of the word, not hearers, only uh, deceiving ourselves. James 4.7, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. The Bible calls Christ's followers to have an attitude of submissive obedience towards our God. Okay, I said a moment ago that the um, Bible doesn't stop there on this topic of submissive obedience. There are certain people that we are also to be in submission to in our lives, says Scripture. When we are young, we're to be in submission to our parents. Ephesians 6.1 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. That's one example. The coronavirus era has given us plenty of opportunity to remember that the Bible also teaches us, whether we're children or adults, 
to have an attitude of submissive obedience to the leaders of the land. 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are set by him, sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Show proper respect to everyone. Romans 13, 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Titus 3.1, Paul instructed Titus to remind the people to be submissive to rulers and authorities and be obedient. Obedience, submission, respect towards those in authority over us, that is the biblical teaching. Uh, Obviously, obedience and submission, those words don't need explanation really. I believe that the word respect, well that would govern how we speak about our leaders, don't you think? And how we write about them on Facebook? So, my friends, Calvary, uh, in this time of mask mandates, I gotta tell you what I see. I see, I observe a lot of disobedience out there. Don't you? A lot of lack of submission. A lot of disrespect, both within the community at large and also within the church of Jesus Christ. And listen, I am not calling for perfection on this. You know, every I dotted and every T crossed type obedience on these mask and social distancing uh, guidelines. You know, it, it really is almost impossible to do that <laughs> with this stuff to be perfectly consistent all the time. Uh, But what I am saying is that we should all be giving obedience to these and and all all regulations, really, a very serious attempt. That would be the right behavior for people who are intent on following the Bible's call to be submissive to our authorities. Author and pastor Dale Robbins wrote, our attitude towards human authorities should be respectful, Cooperative, accountable, humble, helpful, encouraging, and loyal. Not resentful, defiant, or disrespectful. I'd like to read that one again. Our attitude towards human authorities should be respectful, cooperative, accountable, humble, helpful, encouraging, and loyal. Not resentful, Defiant or disrespectful. I believe he's right. Okay, so the Bible teaches submission to our parents. It teaches submission to human authority. What else is there? Uh, Here's another one, and I'll ask that you please listen to all of what I have to say on this next subject through uh, the remainder of my sermon here. So, you know, don't tune me out after this next sentence. Bible teaches that wives are to submit to their husbands. Colossians 3.18, wives submit to your husbands. <laughs> Ephesians 5.22, wives submit, to your, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Uh, the Bible does teach a hierarchy in life. Okay? God and then humans. Parents and then children, husbands and then wives, all humans and then animals, government authorities and then civilians. There's an order to things set up by our creator. And if everyone behaves in their roles as the Bible instructs, both those who are in the leadership positions there and those who are being asked to be submissive, then it's a really good thing. Let's talk about that. Let's look first again at how Jesus behaved in his leadership role. I just said God and then humans. That's the hierarchy in God's system. So Jesus would be in a leadership role over us. We would be in the position of being submissive in in that relationship. Well, how did Jesus exercise his leadership uh, role over us when he was here bodily? 
He did so by serving and by loving. By serving and loving. Remember, things in the kingdom work differently than they uh, do on the earth often. So, yeah, we're to be in submission to uh, Jesus. That's the right order of things. But is it really all that hard to be in submission to a man who is so loving and sacrificial for us, who serves us? So we apply that kingdom principle now to husbands and wives. Yes, wives are to be in submission to their husbands. That's the godly ordained order of things in his creation. But it shouldn't be so hard to ask women to be submissive to their husbands if their husbands are leading by serving and loving their wives with a love like Jesus displayed, right? And were baptized by him in the river Jordan. And that's exactly what the Bible tells husbands to do. Back to the Ephesians 5 passage. Just after the instruction for wives to submit to their husbands, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. I'm going to read a section from an earlier sermon I preached to you on this matter now, uh, uh, taking this one step further uh, you know, into this marriage relationship thing. And, and this first part, again, is directed at the husbands. We're to love our wives. Okay, husbands, let's ask ourselves a, a, a question. Would you want to be part of a marriage where your partner made all of the decisions without taking into account how you felt about things? I don't think you would. And in fact, if your partner did that to you, I think you'd be pretty upset about it. It's my way or the highway. So, husbands, love your wives as you love yourself. Seek her opinions. That's how you would want to be treated. Okay? She should have a say in things, too. And, and, you know, didn't we learn way back in preschool what good behavior in group dynamics are like? Share. Take turns. Care about the other person's feelings. Is it possible that principle applies in preschool but not in the marriage relationship? No way. If you truly love your wife, you will seek her input, husbands. You will want her to be part of decisions. And if you come to a conflict, why can't we exercise the lessons we learned when we were young? Share. Take turns. Husbands, we don't always have to get our way. I'm not saying there's never a, 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 a place for male headship to assert itself within a marriage. There might be a time for that. But it seems to me that if you are really loving each other, you ought to be able to resolve almost every scenario you come up against as a team through sharing and caring and brainstorming solutions together rather than invoking male headship. So wives, submit. Show respect to your husbands. How are you going to do that? Husbands, love your wives with a great servant-type love. I'm thinking if both of you uh, are doing those things well, your marriage is going to work, you know, it's going to go fairly smoothly, I think. Well, this is not the end of it in the Bible on the subject of submission either. Uh, Hebrews 13 talks about how church members are to submit to the leaders in the church. Here's Hebrews uh, 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must, be, uh, who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. And just like in the husband and wife example there, uh, this system only works if both sides are doing it the way the Bible instructs. Right? So uh, church leaders need to lead in godly ways. Uh, that's on me. That's on our church board. And we will be held to account, it says. Please don't expect perfection from us, because if you do, you'll be disappointed. I hope that you can look for the intention. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, we're going to be held account. The rest of that passage is written uh, to you all. And, and then to cap it all off on submission, you have this sentence from Paul, Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission, each to each other. Uh, are you seeing that submission is not such a minor theme in the Bible? The way, thing God, the way God set things up. 
So the coronavirus got me thinking about submission. <laughs> and uh, the more I've gotten into looking at this principle in Scripture, the more I see it's a major theme. And we really should step back for a second and remember here that submission is also what gets us saved. Right? It's what, allow God to, it's what allows God to be able to apply his gift of salvation to a person. God's gift can be applied if a person humbly turns away from sin, submits to Jesus, makes him their Lord. Submission is not a minor theme in our Bibles. Christ followers are called to live our lives with an attitude of submissive obedience in a variety of, of situations. So you can see, I think, why, why I said earlier that we're called to seek to be low on the totem pole rather than high and to be contentedly, contentedly low on the totem pole. That's the direction that both of these attitudes would point us in. So does this low on the totem pole thing that, uh, mean that a Christian should never be in a leadership position? Well, no, we just finished talking about leadership positions that Christians might be in. At some point, uh, uh, the role of a parent, the role of husband, possibly the role of church leader. Uh, all of us have been given a, a, a leadership role over the natural world, animals and, and so forth. And in each of these cases, uh, we are called to exercise those leadership roles in godly, wise, loving ways with a servant's heart. I also don't believe that aiming to be low on the totem pole means that no Christ follower would ever become a CEO or a political leader or you know, one of these other positions that the world considers top of the totem pole. It's just that he or she should go about getting there by not aiming for it. I'm going to tell you a quick story now that will illustrate this nicely for us. Back in the Old Testament era, when Israel was conquered and largely destroyed by the Babylonians. A young man named Daniel was taken from Israel by the Babylonians, forced to live in Babylon and serve the king there. Daniel could have refused to serve this godless king and this evil government. He would have been killed if he'd done that. But let's look at what Daniel did instead. Daniel chose to be submissive and obedient, first off, to God. He obeyed God above the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, just as you know, we should all obey God above any political leader. But where there was no conflict between God's law and what Nebuchadnezzar was asking Daniel to do, there, there Daniel chose to be submissive and obedient to the king. He applied himself. He learned. He served. And because of the, the, the talents that Daniel had, because of his submissive attitude, and because of the ethical ways in which he uh, led his life, Daniel began to be recognized by the leaders in Babylon as being an effective and a helpful person. They began to promote him. And, and after a while... The king himself knew who Daniel was, and when all was said and done, King Nebuchadnezzar assigned to Daniel the third most powerful position in all of Babylon, and Daniel was able to have a godly influence from that position. Well, I just think that's a great example of how a Christian could aim at being low on the totem pole but still end up being near the top. Being top dog was not something Daniel was thinking about. Or looking to be. He, he was focused on serving and being respectful, working hard, honoring God first. And guess what? He got lifted up from his low position placed into a high one. And we should recognize that that's exactly the same story of what happened to Jesus. If we go back to that passage in Philippians 2, which told us that we should have the same attitude that Jesus had. Uh, you know, although he was God, he, he, he took on the nature of a servant and was obedient to death. Right after those words about Jesus, uh, Philippians 2 says this, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge 
he is Lord. So Jesus aimed genuinely, he aimed to be low man on the totem pole, uh, and because of his actions, God raised him up to the very top spot. The people who are going to be in the top positions in God's kingdom are those who genuinely aim low. James 4.10, humble yourselves before God and he will lift you up. Well, isn't this different from what we see in, in the world? With ruthless pursuits of power and prestige. Does this mean we should never apply for a higher position in our work? (laughs) Is putting in an application for a higher position job uh, reflective of selfish ambition? Should we be applying for the low-level job and then just waiting around for our employers to move us up the ladder? You know, I think what I would say to that question is, is talk to God about that one. Putting in a job application doesn't necessarily mean you have selfish ambition in your heart. You know what's in your heart. Let the Spirit of God speak to you on that. Perhaps God will call you to apply to it. Perhaps that's part of his process of lifting you up. Um, You know, it would be really nice if your employer recognized your abilities and asked you to apply, but sometimes employers don't know that we're interested (laughs) if we don't apply, right? And that we're willing to do something else. So I I guess what matters is how you're going about these things and what's in your your heart. Are you seeking to serve or are you aiming to be top dog? Are you approaching all of it with humility? There's a difference between having confidence in your God-given abilities uh, and having arrogant ambition. So I would say go to God with those kinds of questions. Go to the godly, wise people in your life. See what they think. Pray and follow God's leading. Okay, time to bring this one in for a close. We've begun a new year, 2021. I've suggested over my last two sermons for you now that perhaps we ought to focus in this new year on adopting these biblical attitudes into our lives on a more consistent basis. I believe that the attitudes we've talked about, positivity last time, Servanthood and submission this time can greatly impact the effect our lives will have on this planet while we're here. These are attitudes that will determine in large degree how successful we will be in our goal of representing Jesus Christ well, and I know that we all want to do that. So let's together focus in this coming year on the good rather than the bad. Let's stay positive, let's be light in our communities. Let's live with an attitude of humble servanthood towards God and other people. Let's adopt an attitude of submissive obedience for the sake of the Lord, following his lead and his teaching, respectful, cooperative, accountable, humble, helpful, encouraging, and loyal, not resentful, defiant, or disrespectful. And then finally, as we think about our position in life, let's imagine ourselves on that bottom spot of the totem pole and be genuinely content there. And if we are to be lifted up, let it be up to God and others to do the lifting. Would you pray with me? Lord, we live in a world where sometimes people will stop at nothing in order to achieve power and money. And Jesus, you've shown us a different way. Uh, Lord God, may we be like Daniel, cooperative, respectful, hardworking, living a life by the ethics you call us to, not pursuing power. May, may we be like that. And then, Lord, move us into whatever position or task you uh, want for us, whatever you deem is best for us, Father. How and where can we serve you, Lord? That's where we want to be. So bring us there. Lord God, bring into all of our hearts the, the humble attitude that you ask of us in your word. In the areas in which you've called us to be submissive, 
Remind and enable us to be submissive. In the areas in which you have put us into leadership positions, remind and enable us to lead with a servant's heart and with great love and wisdom. Most of all today, uh, Father God, we thank you for sending Jesus to us who modeled all of this for us and who gave himself up for us in servanthood and in submission. May we all seek to be like him. Amen.